In fact, the only surefire way to survive a modern horror movie, you pretty much have to be gay. This is a load of barnacles. Scream 4 was released back in 2011, 11 years after the original trilogy ended. The plan following Scream 4's release was going to be that of a new trilogy, but due to reasons, it never came to fruition. And with the sad passing of the legendary Wes Craven in 2015, it shut the doors as the end of the Wes Craven era. Today, I will be reviewing Scream 4 and seeing if it's a true return to form for the series going forward. Let's get into it. Welcome back, I'm Sippin' Ice, and Scream 4 has always been a well-regarded sequel in my eyes, with a well-rounded and intense killer to back up the fresh storyline. But before we get into it, you already know, spoiler alert from the movie released in 2011. Also, again, thank you for 1,000 subscribers. I truly appreciate every single one of you. I have something special planned, so stay to the end to learn more. Now, let's stop wasting time and get right on into it. The film opens up onto two friends, Sherry and Trudy, as they receive a call from our titular killer. Eventually, Sherry opens the door and steps outside, but no one is out there, so we think. Out steps Ghostface slashing Trudy's throat, but before Sherry can run, out jumps a second Ghostface. Title card. Yep, that was fake. It was a movie. Friends Rachel and Chloe are arguing over the staff franchise. Chloe, aggravated, calls out Rachel by stabbing her. Then, title card. Yep. Another fake out. But that was the last one, I promise. Jenny and Marnie were watching the latest Stab film. After some time, Ghostface, the real one this time, calls Jenny to threaten her. He tosses Marnie through the glass door and chases Jenny throughout the house. The game of cat and mouse ends when he stabs her in the back and she falls into the garage. In an homage to Tatum, Ghostface uses the garage door by having it go up and then slam down onto her back. He then finishes her off with an off-screen stab as the title card slashes onto our screens. Not my favorite opening scene. In fact, it's my least favorite of the franchise. I get it, the fake outs are meta and different, but once was enough. Twice was just mean, dude. Had me not trusting if Marty and Jenny were real, considering they were watching a movie, in a movie, in a movie, movie. But before we are introduced to our new friend group, we catch up with our big three. Sydney is back in Woodsboro to promote her new book, Out of the Darkness. Dewey wakes up to a call and gets ready for work. Our boy got that promotion. He is now the sheriff of Woodsboro. As he leaves, we see Gail sleeping in their bed, still married after 10 whole years. Next up, we meet Kirby. Kirby. A horror movie buff who is a personal fan favorite of mine as she speeds down the road to pick up her two friends, Olivia Morris and final girl newcomer, Jill Roberts. As they head to school, we learn Jill has recently broken up with her cheater boyfriend, Trevor Sheldon, who has both called Kirby and Olivia in hopes of reaching out. They arrive to Woodsboro High, where they run into the film club members, Robbie and Charlie. Robbie hounds them with questions as it's the anniversary of the original murders. Robbie has this like 24-7 live stream camera strapped to his head, which, by the way, bro would have thrived in the 2020s as that IRL live streaming thing has become its own subgenre at this point. Later, we see Sydney at one of her book signings with her manager Rebecca as Gail and the police arrive. Dewey and Deputy Judy Hicks track a cell phone to Sydney's rental car. Someone planted evidence in her trunk, forcing her to stay in Woodsboro as she is now a part of the investigation. Which, by the way, I really like that because otherwise Sydney could have just left. So I like that they actually had a reason to force her to stay. While Dewey is asking Sydney some questions, Gail heads over after eating one of Judy's lemon squares and tries to enter the room. But Judy keeps her out, leading to some of the best lines of the movie. When Gail calls Judy Betty Crocker, it caught me off guard. It was so good, dude. And don't get me started on this. Their lemon squares taste like ass. Dewey and Sydney ask Jill, Olivia, and Kirby some questions because Jill and Olivia received a call from Ghostface. Catching up with Gail, as she leaves the station, she runs into Rebecca, who is not the best at having a human conversation. She is extremely rude. As the day winds down, Sydney prepares for bed at the Roberts residence. She goes to tell Jill goodnight, meanwhile Jill is having a conversation with her ex-boyfriend, who loves to enter and exit through a window, similar to a previous ex-boyfriend. Speaking of Trevor, 
Bro just loves to be a red herring. He is not helping his case by lurking around corners and saying killer things. Bro has a whole arrow saying, hey guys, I should be a suspect. Perkins and Hans, two officers stationed outside Jill's house, watch as Olivia goes home. While Jill and Kirby watch Shaun of the Dead, Olivia has started calling Sydney the Angel of Death. After some time, Jill receives a call from who they believe to be Trevor. But in reality, it's a whispering ghost face. How did you know that? Because I'm standing in the closet. Excuse me, was you saying something? Wonder why he's whispering. He tells them that he is in the closet, but when Kirby checks, no one's there. But he never said he was in their closet. Out they pop from across the street attacking Olivia. He stabs, slashes, and tears her apart, tossing her through the upstairs window. It's a very gory kill for the franchise. In fact, it's one of the most intense kills Ghostface has ever pulled off. Before we are able to get comfortable though, Ghostface pops out slashing Jill's arm, similar to Derek in Scream 2. But unlike Scream 2, Sydney beats the brakes off bro, but they escape as she looks away. Trevor's guilty ass comes around the corner asking what happened. Sydney did claim a battle scar, so she heads to the hospital. Gil runs into Charlie and Robbie and sets up a meeting with them and Sydney, and in return, they give them their knowledge of the new age horror film buffs. Meanwhile, back in the hospital, Sydney fires her manager because Rebecca doesn't care about the victims and those that the story hurts. Rebecca, you know, being fired and all, heads to the parking garage so she can leave. But it's not going to be that easy. She gets a call from someone wanting to speak with Sydney. She says she will take a message, but then Ghostface claims Rebecca herself is the message. Which is so wild, by the way. Could you imagine that? And one, why is, why is Rebecca even saying that she'll take a message? Rebecca, dog, you're fired, dude. What are you doing? She rushes to her car, and once in, she checks her surroundings. Seeing nothing, she tries to peel out, but her car is goofing on her. Ghostface drops down onto her car, scaring her. Having to leave the safety of her car, she takes off running to the stairs. She grabs at the handle, but it breaks off. She turns around to see Ghostface charging her, stabbing her deep in the gut. During this, Dewey and the police force are giving a public briefing on the situation that has been unfolding. Mirroring the scene of when Ghostface fell from above onto Rebecca's car, we hear a scream and as everyone turns to look, we see Rebecca falling from above, landing on a news van down below. This death scene was always one of my favorites of the movie, but the one thing I don't get and I have never gotten is why did the door handle just come off so easily? I don't know, maybe I missed something, let me know. The next day, Sydney and Gail honor their end of the deal by showing up to the film club's meeting. Sydney notices the gear Robbie is wearing and asks, so, you film your entire high school appearance and post it on the net? And he just answers that soon everyone will be doing it. And by God is he right. TikTok, Instagram, you name it, it has it. Everyone posts their entire lives on the social media and Robbie Mercer knew it would happen back in 2011. Wild. Oh, by the way, this club is basically our classroom scene of the film. Charlie and Robbie fill in for our beloved Randy here, but they can never replace you, big dog, trust. From them, we learned the rules to making a scream make, as dubbed by them, a new version of a remake, one that still has rules to follow, just rules that have changed. One, the unexpected is the new cliche. Two, the opening sequence has to blow the doors off. Three, the kills have to be more extreme. Four, the rules are reversed from the original. But never fear, for they also gave us the apparently only surefire way to survive these scream makes. You have to be gay. <laughs> yeah, it's very silly. And it comes back into play later. After we hear these so-called rules from the off-brand Timu Randy wannabes, they clue us in on a major party happening that night. Third act has to have a party. This one is called the Stabathon. It's pretty clear what that entails, but it's a marathon of all the stab movies. Sydney and Gail leave without knowing the party's location, but that's never stopped Gail before. But before that, we do see Sydney talking to Jill about her past and Jill's present. I love their bonding here as it seems like the passing of the torch through their family ties. Kirby talks to Jill as she arrives at the killer's wet dream. A full-on barn turned into a party with a projector and dozens of drunk teens. And since it's obvious the killer will show up, Trevor's also here. You don't want to be like this. This is disgusting. 
I mean, why wouldn't he be? Apparently, right? Brother is a red herring. Might as well call him that. Trevor Red Herring Sheldon. Anyways, as Stab 1 begins, we see Gail has arrived and begun placing four cameras around the barn in order to keep watch, similar to how she did in the original. But two can play at that game. We see someone has started turning every camera as to not allow Gail to see anything. And before they cover up the final camera, Ghostface shows their face, acting like bro's trying to FaceTime his crush or something. After talking to Gail on the phone, Dewey turns on his sirens and begins flying there. Multiple things begin happening here, all at once. As Dewey arrives to the farm, he sees Gail on the camera and behind her, a fast approaching ghost face. He begins attacking her while the climax of Stab's opening plays on in the background. Dewey shows up as they stab Gail on the shoulder and he scares them away with a few rounds because apparently Dewey does target practice with his eyes closed. Here is where we learn a partial motive. This time around, the killer is making the movie. Catching up with the boys Haas and Perkins, as they do have some of the best back and forth sequences in the movie. They aren't alone, and neither is Sydney and Kate. Sydney sees a set of wind jumps hanging that she takes down, while Haas heads back to Perkins after his perimeter check. Haas then gets backstabbed, and Perkins, well, Perkins, he, uh, he took a knife to the doggin, deep too, and he gets out of the car in order to start shadow boxing only to fall to his knees and say the best final words of anyone. Fuck Bruce Willis. Fuck Bruce Willis. While this scene is silly, it's actually based on a true story Wes Craven read about where a man took a knife to the brain filled cavity and just casually walked into a hospital. Crazy, dude. Remember when I mentioned Sydney and Kate also weren't alone? That's because they are now getting attacked. At the back door, Sid sees those same wind chimes are back up, and in the reflection, she sees a Ghostface mask. So she shuts the door, and they run to the front door. Ghostface is there, but they manage to shut the door on them. But not before Kate received a bloody knife in the mail. You've got mail. We see the knife exiting the mail slot as Kate falls forward. Sydney flees the scene as she races to Kirby's house to try and save Jill. Welcome to the final act. The remaining survivors of the friend group and Trevor try to regroup as they learn Trevor was invited by Jill, but at the same time, no one. Again, red herring, dude. Robbie heads outside to drink his pain away and to increase it more as he comes face to face with our main man, Ghostface. He gets stabbed once in the stomach and a second time in the back as he tries to flee. He gets thrown down to the ground, but before the money shot, Ghostface stops as Robbie says that there are rules. He busts open his sacred book of bullshit and claims he is gay in order to try and live. But Ghostface ain't having it and delivers the final blow as we then cut back to Kirby. Jill comes downstairs to meet up with her, wanting to find their missing friends and Trevor. They decide to check outside but get jump scared by Sydney, who has just arrived. But so has Robbie. Apparently his one stupid rule were and he's dead. Yep, that rule is cheeks, Robbie. Ghostface chases Sydney onto the roof while Jill hides under the bed. This gives her just enough time to call Dewey and have the whole police department alerted. She eventually meets up and hides with Kirby, who then sees Charlie stuck outside begging to be let in. Not able to trust him, she doesn't let him in. That's when Ghostface then grabs him and the lights shut off. Paying homage to the original, once again, we see Kirby having to answer trivia in order to try and save Charlie. But again, she is tricked. She heads outside to untie him, man. <laughs> His thanks for saving him? He stabbed her twice in the gut, leaving her to die. Yep, nice guy, Charlie. Afterwards, Charlie finds Sydney and grabs her, but she gets away from him only to get stabbed by a second ghost face. Jill, her own family. Can you believe it? Sydney's own family out to get her, dude? Crazy, who could even think of that? During the monologues, Charlie tosses out a tied up Trevor. And Jill shoots bro in the pee pee, dude. Let it out. <laughs> Let it out. <laughs> like, holy crap, dude. Just take me out at that point. Send me packing. I, I couldn't do it. He gets spared with one going to the forehead. <laughs> Jill and Charlie begin the whole stab each other stuff in homage to Billy and Stu. But unlike them, Jill goes for the heart ending Charlie as she wants all the fame for herself. Jill lets one rip into Sid's gut, and believing she won, she begins the best scene of the film, and the scene that turned Jill into one of the best ghost faces of all time. 
She uses Trevor's hands to scratch and rip out some hair, followed by a self-shoulder stab. Then she runs face first into a picture frame, causing glass to cut up her face. And to finish it off, she jumps back onto the glass coffee table. She lays down next to Sydney, securing herself as a victim. Dewey finally arrives after like 45 days and sees the bloodbath. Everyone is wheeled out and either taken to the morgue or to the hospital. As she is wheeled out, Jill is hounded by reporters, giving her the sense of victory and the fame she so craved. At the hospital, we learn some crazy stuff. Jill mentions her matching wounds with Gail and that Sydney is still alive. As Dewey goes to Gail, Jill goes to Sydney. But after realizing Jill's slip up, he rushes to help Sydney and that he does. He rushes in and gets bashed over the head over and over again by a bedpan. <laughs> but he does help in a way by calling for Judy, who then saves Gail by tackling her out of the way. But then Jill does take Judy's gun and lands one in her chest, which is when she begins holding Gail at gunpoint. Meanwhile, Sydney has started charging the defibrillator. She uses it and clears her mind. Not knowing when enough is enough, Jill goes for the kill shot one more time only to get one of the chest, ending her. But unlike Jill, Judy survived her chest shot due to her bulletproof vest. The movie ends with reporters talking about Jill being a hero, not yet knowing what she did. Scream 4 is a great sequel that begins the process of passing the torch from the old to the new generation. No longer was Sydney the primary focus, as although Jill was a ghost face, she was the surrogate final girl that sought to eliminate Sydney to truly be the only final girl. Which, that's the one thing I also love about this movie. Jill being a killer was not very predictable, and her motive was a fresh take besides revenge. I will have to rate Scream 4 at 8 out of 10. It was a great film with some interesting and fresh directions. Before we head out though, my 1000 subscriber special is on its way. It'll be a live stream where we decide who would win in a battle to the death tournament style. You will have a chance to make your opinions known, but make sure you are up to date on your horror movie knowledge, as I have tons of horror movie icons up to bat. But what did you think about Scream 4? What do you rank it? Let me know down in the comments. If you enjoyed, please consider hitting that like button and subscribing. And with that, stay chill and I will see you next time.